high school. And it was a good song. It was a very good song. Well, what happened is, um, I don't know. Mr. Lee, could you pass these out, please? Um, we're in Colossians chapter 2 this week. We'll be looking at there, and we'll be looking at some other places also. We'll start out Colossians chapter 2. We're looking at uh, wisdom this week, God's or the world. Um, last week we looked at about what a wise man is, and uh, about some things about the wise man. This week we're looking at uh, uh, basically what the Bible has to say about God's wisdom versus the world's wisdom. There is wisdom which is false wisdom, which really isn't wisdom, which a believer needs to have no part of, and indeed a believer ought to be opposed to and against. Um, false wisdom is not from God. It is not a good thing. And when we as believers uh, put false wisdom into practice in our lives, it always has bad results. It always leads us bad places, and it causes us hurt, and it causes us grief, and it causes us lost opportunity for ministry and hurts those around us. Um, false wisdom is always a bad thing. And uh, there's a number of ways false wisdom gets into us. We'll look at some of that today about philosophy and vain deceit. The world has um, all kinds of false wisdom for us. In all kinds of ways it uh, tries to bombard us. There's uh, all kinds of snares of the devil. We'll look at some of this today. Colossians chapter 2, verses uh, 1 through 15. We'll start with a few verses here. For I would that ye know what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be knit, might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Let's go ahead and pray. Your God, please be with us this morning in Sunday school. Help us to see that we of our own selves are not wise and that we need you. Help us to see that we need heavenly truth, not the world's truth, which is lies. And help us to see that uh, the ways of this world are not right and that they're not equal, but that your ways are equal and that we need your ways. Please uh, give us a hunger and thirst after righteousness this morning, a desire to be taught your word, and a desire to learn. And uh, please be in the service to follow in a great and mighty way. Fill Pastor Price with your power. Please bring some unsaved folk in who will get saved this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. Um, first, we see here in these first few verses about what true wisdom is. And it's in Christ, it says... Uh, in whom, that's talking about Christ from the last verse, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Um, someone go ahead and name someone who's known on this earth for being a wise man. Who's, who's, Gandhi. Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi. He's often put out there as a wise man. <laughs> who's another wise man they'll talk about or quote or something? The Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama. <laughs> who's another one? Einstein, does he get quoted much? Mm. Not as much, but he actually some. I, actually, I've seen a bunch of spurious Einstein quotes. Yeah. They weren't really Einstein, but supposedly he was. But he was known for being uh, very smart and writing a lot of things on blackboards. At least that's the pictures I see of him. So he would definitely qualify. Um, let's see. Some others I thought of, you know, uh, Socrates and Plato, Aristotle, the Greek sort of wisdom, the Eastern sort of wisdom, as uh, we all mentioned this morning, which is good. Um, when Pastor Shermerhorn comes here, the only wisdom he ever talks about is the Greek wisdom, and all the Eastern wisdom gets totally ignored by him, So, um, which is fine because it's all hogwash anyway. It's just something which I always thought was funny. Is, see, it always... There wasn't much technological development out of the Eastern wisdom mindset. There really wasn't. And it, that's actually what it does do. It's kind of one of the funny ramifications they don't wear of it. Deodorant, those people. <laughs> well, actually, a lot of the people, and I've heard people in Europe don't either, where a lot of the Greek wisdom came around from, from people who went over so there. So that's probably non sequitur. Um, anyway, 
Uh, there's all kinds of wisdom. People look to Confucius for wisdom, and he wrote a lot of wise sayings. We have some of our own American um, American philosophers, if you will. Uh, ben Franklin. Who knows that? Ben, who can give me a good Ben Franklin quote? He had like a lot of homespun wisdom. They call it or whatever. What's a Ben? Penny saved is a penny earned. A penny saved is a penny earned. A stitch in time saves nine. Early to bed, early to are those all Ben Franklin quotes? It's better to wait and know it than date to blow it. That's not. We're going to have to do something with you this morning. Um, ben Franklin's quotes had some wisdom in them. You know, he s said something like, you know, a penny saved is a penny earned. So if you don't spend a penny on something you don't need, it's like you had an extra penny. Or early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Although he himself stayed up late studying, so I don't... <laughs> know how well he even followed his own wisdom but um anyway so there's certain truths of a sort if you would which if you follow them could make your life seem to go better um interestingly enough when a person does anything in a disciplined method it tends to make his life go better if for no other reason than the discipline thereof i've met a number of people who've been jehovah's witnesses who talk about becoming a jehovah's witness really helped their life and uh, one of the thing about the Jehovah's Witnesses is they're very into uh, schedules and self-discipline and all this whatnot. And uh, the thing is, is uh, they didn't get their life clean from sin. They just learned to put themselves on a disciplined schedule, which even a dog can learn how to do. You can learn to discipline a dog. So there's nothing spiritual about the Jehovah's Witness sort of discipline. It's just, you know, it, it's just a, a, a set of disciplines. It's a set of learnings. But these kind of things, worldly wisdom, can seem to have some kind of earthly benefit. And uh, there is some helpful wisdom in uh, some of those sayings. But the real thing is, is it's not wisdom in Christ. And uh, just the uh, earthly philosophers and their wisdom isn't the only kind of worldly wisdom at all. There's far more than that, as we'll see in a bit. But that's just something kind of to compare to it. These people here... Uh, Paul was writing to the Colossians, they would have been very familiar with the Greek wise men of their time, if you will. Wisdom was a very big thing in Greece. And as we'll see in 1 Corinthians, if we get there, which we will, um, wisdom was a really big deal to the Greeks. And uh, the Colossians would have been kind of a Greekish people. And so wisdom was a really big deal to them, the words of, of the philosophers and such. And... Uh, uh, debate and philosophy and intellectual exercise was a really big thing to these people. Um, in Christ, it says, is hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's right. And it says this, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Um, we're to grow in Christ and learn of him, not in the world, and the devil is always trying to beguile us with enticing words. This is kind of a bit of a rabbit trail, but false doctrines often encase themselves in enticing, tricky words. They sound good. They tickle the intellect. They're uh, intellectually stimulating. We all like to be uh, intellectually stimulated on some level. We like a mental challenge to some degree at least. You know, uh, these kind of things are interesting to us. We like learning. Uh, most people like, except... Nearly everybody likes to learn, at least something on some level they like to learn and develop themselves. False doctrine loves to encase itself in enticing words. False doctrine loves to, it, it, it always, in fact, builds itself on the wisdom of men, never on the power of God. So beware lest the devil gets you through enticing words. Um, he says this, the Bible says this in... Uh, in verse 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Um, what we need to grow in is Christ. We need to uh, be steadfast in Christ, as it says in verse 5. We jumped past it. We, as we received Christ, we believed in him by faith, so we need to walk in him by faith. That's the same manner as we received him, so we need to walk in him. And we need to root up and build ourselves in him. It's kind of idea of, I guess, if you will, a little bit like a tree is rooted in something. That's, that's where it gets its strength from. It, it grows its roots deep. Um, and it, uh, 
I'll often grip, it'll spread its roots out inside the uh, soil or around the rocks and kind of grip onto them. Um, uh, Brother Al isn't here. I wish he were here. I need him for this. There's this tree, you know those yellow trees? Or, I mean, those trees with the yellow flowers. You know how they're always leaning over? Well, he was telling me for those trees to grow right, what you have to do is put some boulders down with their roots because where their natural habitat is is cliffs. And they grow on these windy cliffs, I guess, somewhere in the world, you know, these seaside cliffs and things. But because they're rooted into these rocks, they grow well. And here in the Florida soil, we don't really have those rocks available, so the trees always bow over. We need to be rooted in, in Christ and built up in Christ, which I guess maybe is kind of the idea of a building. Um, our foundation is in Him, and our establishment is in Him, and then our continuance is in Him. And Christ is what we need to be built up in. And the reason we need to be built up in Christ is because, among other reasons, there are those who would beguile us with enticing words, who would lead us away into false doctrine. A, a very important reason for a Christian to, be, to grow into Christ is because if you don't grow in Christ like you need to, you will be very vulnerable to false doctrine. You will be uh, very much able to become a victim of, of the lies of the devil. Um, let's see. About true wisdom, it's found in Christ. Christ is the true wisdom. In him are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so Christ is what we need to be wise. Last week we looked about uh, the wise man and about how he ought to be teachable. But as was brought up by Pastor Price, the wise man does not necessarily just follow every wisdom which is tossed at him haphazardly. The world will throw at us much wisdom, if you will, and will throw at us many ways of thinking. But we shouldn't follow them. The Bible says this in verse 8. We're going to look at some uh, false wisdom. Verse 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you. This is kind of an extra, it's not in the notes, but it says any man. There are all kinds of people who could become a spoiler of you. There are people who paint themselves as being godly, separated Christians who will spoil you with uh, false doctrine, as we'll see here. There's people who could be relatives, there's people who could be intellectuals, there's world systems, there's all kinds of ways the devil tries to spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit here. It says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So what is worldly wisdom? Well, I have here some earmarks of worldly wisdom. That is, some ways you can identify worldly wisdom. The Bible has them here for us in this verse. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. And philosophy, you know, the word there is literally the love of wisdom. That's, that's the idea behind the word philosophy. But it's kind of like a philosophy is a teaching. It's kind of a mindset. A philosophy is a way of thinking. It is um, basically how we think about something. And any wisdom which is apart from Christ it's the wisdom of this world is this uh, philosophy we are to be aware of. The world's teachings, its mindsets, the world view. And what's interesting is that these mold our thinking with exposure. Um, the more we expose ourselves to something, the more we um, begin to accept it into our own thinking, if you will. It's a person needs to be very careful about what they let inside their mind and who we let shape our thinking. It's, it's interesting sometimes to think about why I think a certain way about something and to track back to who gave me that idea to start thinking that way about it. It's interesting. Find something you think of, some way you think about something and track back where you started thinking about it. Who molded your thinking into that? Um... The devil tries to use all kinds of ways of this world, all the different communications of this world and the ways of this world to steer our thinking into that which is wicked, both in obvious overt methods and in subtle covert methods, if you will, to use uh, some fancy rhyming words there. But the devil tries to steer our thinking into disaster away from Christ. And he uses all kinds of methods. And 
what he, the devil wants to do is to get our wisdom to be outside of Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, we're at. Um, as I was saying, these things, the wisdom of the world, it molds our thinking through exposure. The Bible says we're not altogether out of this world. We're in this world to be salt. We're in this world to be light. But we can't let this world tell us how to think. That's right. If we do, the world will spoil us. The Bible says, beware lest any man spoil you. Um, the idea behind spoil there, I forgot to talk about it. You know, it's kind of like uh, pirates. Um, imagine pirates coming to our town. If we were uh, back in old Florida, supposing we were a small city or a village, they'd come to the town, they'd perhaps kill all the people around or rob everything they had, and uh, whoever would be left they didn't kill, they'd torture until they told them where the rest of their gold was. Go ahead and look up about Henry Morgan, Francois Olenay, and all those other terrifying pirates of the Caribbean of the 16 and 1700s, whom I've been researching for VBS. Um, go ahead and look up about those characters. They were in general pretty terrible, and they would spoil towns. Well, the devil wants to spoil you through wisdom. He wants to raid, to pillage, to leave you empty and ruined by way of his worldly wisdom. He wants to get into you. And uh, the way he does it is through you know, through the people around us or through that which they've created through the media around us. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. And the next thing is through vain deceit. Any wisdom which is a lie is vain deceit. Any way of thinking which is opposed to God is false wisdom. Seems kind of obvious, but I think sometimes we kind of get into a mindset where we forget that. Or we just kind of say, oh, well, it's okay. You know, it's maybe not right, but it's kind of okay. We let these kind of mindsets into our head, and that's a worldly mindset. That is worldly philosophy that something which is opposed to Christ is okay. It's not okay. Um, it's not good to be opposed to Christ. The God who bought us, who uh, paid for our sins, to be opposed to him is a real tragedy. To be filled with the wisdom of the world is a real tragedy. It's a bad thing. It's a travesty. It's a disaster for a Christian to be opposed to Christ. But we become that way when we're filled with this vain deceit. Uh, after the tradition of men. You know, the tradition is of men. It's, it's the world's way of doing things instead of God's way. God does have a way of doing things. The Bible talks about a godly conversation. That is a godly lifestyle, a godly way of living. The, the Bible does talk about how we ought to live. And it uh, talks about the great freedom we have in Christ to glorify God and not live for sin. And uh, the world's way is, instead of trying to live for God a holy and pure sanctified life, to try to live a life of self-pleasure and of um, a life which, perhaps instead of trying to become like Christ, is satisfied with enough of Christ that things are okay and then a little bit of the world too just for enjoyment. Um, being a godly Christian is not just showing up to church, if you will, and punching our clock in, and uh, we, we made it to church that week, or uh, even a few times that week. There's so much more to it than that. Christ wants to be our all. In Christ, it says, our all, let me read that verse again, are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And Christ is everything. Um, the rudiments of this world... Rudiment is a word we don't really use in modern English much. I didn't really know exactly what it meant. I had an idea, but I didn't really know what it meant exactly. So I looked it up in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. The Webster's 1828 Dictionary is a great book. It was written by a godly man who wanted other people to become godly people. So he wrote a dictionary of the English language to define the words, and he wrote, defined <clears throat> a lot of the words as they're found in the Bible. And uh, so that's a great dictionary to look at. It won't try to twist your thinking into evil ways. Modern dictionaries do that. It's subtle but profound. Modern dictionaries do try to actually twist your mind into the thinking the world's way. It's interesting. Look, look carefully at some modern dictionary. Look at the philosophy they'll try to teach you through it. Everything has a philosophy. Um, Pastor McClure used to say, everything has a philosophy. Every teacher has a philosophy. The ungodly have a philosophy, and uh, they try to put it in you. Uh, everything, Everyone has some philosophy they're trying to teach, whether it's uh, overtly or covertly. Every, everything has a philosophy, and the ungodly try to put it in us. But the rudiments is like the fundamentals, the basics, the basic teachings. 
the basic teachings of this world on life and how to live life. Um, this could be everything from an unsaved person telling you, well, I, like I've, I've known Christians sometimes to get advice from unsaved people about what to do in their family, and that can't possibly work. How can someone who doesn't even know God tell you how to run something which was designed by God? That doesn't make sense. Um, they may have some things which may seem to work for a little while or some little uh, helpful sounding aphorisms or fancy words and sort of things, but if Christ made the family, we need Christ to tell us how to run the family, not the world. And so the rudiments of this world, they also are something we must be aware of. They are not after Christ. That's the real key thing about this worldly wisdom is it is not after Christ. It is opposed to Christ. It is against Christ. Yes? I don't want to interrupt your mid-statement, but uh, you mentioned the covert versus overt philosophy and philosophical training. Here's something I've realized. Uh, sometimes the world is very in your face, which is overt, about their philosophy. And what I have realized is that, you know, you many times Christians think, well, it is so blatant that it's not going to affect me because I know what it is, I know what they're saying. But what I found is that Christians or that the world is so over the top enforcing that philosophy. For instance, this teacher in Boca Raton a couple of weeks ago that uh, required students to, to write the name of Christ on a paper and stomp on it, you know. Uh, okay, that's over. That's in your face. And of course, you know, one teacher, one student refused to do it and all the responses that come with it. But here's what actually happens with the overt philosophy. They push it in your face so much that we concede the small points. In other words, we fight the big points and we can see the little ones and we've just accepted their philosophy. The political correct thing right now that's going on in our country, that happened back in the 1980s. They started really pushing political correctness and we made fun of it. We thought it was funny and silly. Out of the political correctness came hate crimes, which then became the, uh, the forward marching propaganda of the homosexual movement so that today you're not even allowed to say, I mean, as a Christian, we almost cringe saying that homosexuality is a sin, you know, because we're, it's hateful, and it's, and so that overt, you know, pushing something blatant at you has made it so that we've conceded that, you know, basically Christians today really, for the most part, feel as that, well, it's not that bad, you know, we, we shouldn't say it, you should come out and say that something's bad. And then, uh, for instance, this week, we had Muslim terrorists blow up our people, killed four individuals in Boston, injured over 120 people, and we have Muslim imams uh, that are performing the, um, the, uh, the, the memorial ceremony in Boston. And people uh, deleted me on Twitter because I said that I didn't think that that was appropriate. And I made a statement about, are we going to build a mosque where the runner store was, like we did building a mosque across from 9-11. That happened, people. That's what, the, the Islamists are trying to kill us. But because we don't want to be hateful in our speech, because of the overt, we give up the covert. Well, it's like, well, you know what, don't, I mean, it is literally politically incorrect. The FBI has written it out of their manuals to use the words jihad, to use the words Muslim Brotherhood, and that is overt. In other words, the jihadists are trying to push, we want Sharia law in America. And so, well, let's stop them from Sharia law, but let's don't say that their religion is evil. And that, that's a good example. Those things are good examples of how we think, how we're affected by the world's thinking. We just think, well, be careful how you say things. The truth is, is that any Muslim, and I'm getting off on to, to the Islam because it's a current <coughs> event right now, but any Muslim who is not radicalized is just not devout. He's just not a faithful, he's not a good Muslim. But any Muslim that wants to get serious about his religion before he dies must blow people up and kill them. And in our country, we can't say that. In letters, what I just said is hate speech. Yeah. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's interesting how we Christians often, we, uh, 
just we think we're we, not influenced we, by the COVID. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, we're, we've been influenced by it. We, we, we sometimes think that, well, it's so open that it won't affect us. But here's something, like he was saying, it kind of brought to mind some, I forget where I read it, but you know, if you saw a tank in your backyard, you'd be terrified. But after three days of that tank being in your backyard, you wouldn't think anything about it. You know, like like a military tank. Imagine one day you woke up and there's a tank in your backyard. It'd be horrifying. Well, three days later, it'd be nothing. You'd be hanging your laundry off the uh, front barrel of it. <laughs> well, and, and that's how we are as people, and that's how we are with uh, philosophy. With philosophy, we get conditioned. if we if we accept that it's okay, or even allow it to be around us. We allow it to influence us, it'll destroy us, and this is why it's extremely important for Christian education for young people, <sighs> is because uh, the philosophies of this world are very subtle, even when they're out and open and jumping on us, they're very subtle about how they break in and they influence us and they spoil us and they destroy us. And um, worldly wisdom is opposed to Christ. Verse 9 says this, For in him that's in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Which is better, the rudiments of, this, of the world or the fullness of Christ? There is no benefit in seeking after the wisdom of the world. All the fullness of God is in Christ. And all the treasures of God are in Christ. All, all the promises of God are in Christ are in Him. And yea, verily, as it says in Romans, and these things are good and they're wonderful. In Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We are complete in Christ. We don't need the wisdom of this world. Why? Because... Uh, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Somebody uh, around this time was trying to get the Colossian people to fall into uh, the Gnostic air. Uh, Gnosticism is basically a fancy Greek word. G-N-O-S-T-I-C is how it's spelled. The Gnostics were people who were big into wisdom. And Gnosis is basically knowledge uh, or something like that, basically. I don't know the exact translation, but that's how we use it in English. Diagnosis is a similar word we use, uh, basically determining what is the knowledge of what something is. Uh, the Gnostics were really deep into trying to learn all this wisdom and this hidden wisdom and these hidden truths. Well, the hidden wisdom for Christians is Jesus. That's the kind of wisdom we need. We don't need intellectual exercise of the world. To be our wisdom, we have Christ. We are complete in Him. It says, In whom ye also are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which were was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. Christ has saved us from our sins. He saved us from the curse of the law. He dealt with all the sins which were against us. They were nailed to his cross. He triumphed over them openly. Because of the, he saved us, as all these things, we need to live and walk in Him, not in the wisdom of this world. Romans uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6 is what comes to mind. We won't jump there for sake of time, but it's in your notes. Romans 6, 1 through 6 talks about how we're buried in Christ and we're raised to walk in newness of life. And because of that, um, because Christ died for us, all these things, we are debtors to live for Him and not after this world. Worldly wisdom is foolish for a believer to live in because Christ is our fullness. He died for us. He paid for our sins. He triumphed openly over uh, all the things which were against us. We are complete in Him, and Him is all the fullness of God. All this fullness of God which is in Christ is what we need. We don't need anything else. And anything else which we try to add <coughs> is horrible. And not only just horrible, it's uh, destructive to us. And it's when we decide to turn away from Christ to the world's wisdom, it's kind of betraying Christ in a way, if you will. It's, uh, it's, it's a very sad thing when we do it, when we choose the wisdom of the world over Christ. Um, from, uh, concerning uh, God's wisdom, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, 
not with words of wis with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. We see here a whole long passage, which really stretches through to the end of chapter two, about wisdom and what is real wisdom. And God's wisdom is basically it's the gospel, it's the foolishness of preaching. Paul tells the Corinthians, these Corinthians are also Greek people. Um, they're about as Greek as you could get back then, these Corinthians. And uh, what he tells them is that the preaching of the cross didn't come with man's wisdom. It wasn't worldly wisdom. It wasn't through intellectual exercise. This is a danger believers can get into as they start making their Christianity an issue of how smart they are. Sometimes I see this, unfortunately, in the uh, creation science movement. All of a sudden, Christianity becomes, um, instead of about Christ, it becomes about complicated explanations and arguments and reasons for why evolution makes no sense. And it can get really in-depth and involved. And uh, the preaching of the cross doesn't come with words of wisdom. I see this in the apologetics movement a lot. Um, complicated arguments for why there has to be a God and uh, objective morality and all these different things and uh, a person doesn't get saved with wisdom of words and it's not that anything there's per se bad in of itself about creation science or perhaps even about a lot of the apologetic things people get into but the problem is that they get into that instead of Christ and when you're into science or into uh, apologetics instead of Christ you're out of Christ and when you're out of Christ, you're into the wisdom of this world. And when you're into the wisdom of this world, you're being spoiled and destroyed. And one of the interesting things uh, the wisdom of this world does is sometimes it might destroy us a little bit on the surface, but who it really gets is our next generation. What happened once upon a time, long time ago in the 1800s, is uh, there was this guy named Darwin who decided that uh, he would invent his theory of evolution, although he just pretty much... Uh, plagiarized a bunch of other people who were around and put a new spin on it. There was nothing new he came up with at all. Anyway, so he had his theory of evolution and there were all these Christians who wanted to look smart. They didn't want to sound dumb to uh, other believers. So what they did is they said, well, you know, God used evolution to create the world. That's worldly wisdom. What happened? All their kids turned into modernists. Well, the Bible's not really real. God's not real. Miracles aren't real. Or God is sort of real, but who cares? And Christianity became an intellectual exercise. Their kids were lost. Their grandkids were lost. Their grandkids became wild, raging liberals. And that's kind of where we are where we are today, is people threw God out. And why did they throw God out? It's because they took the wisdom of the world. That's why they threw God out. They didn't want to look stupid. There are these Christians who didn't want to look like they weren't scientific and intellectual, so they accepted evolution. Once they accepted evolution, they basically threw the Bible out. They threw God's wisdom out. They threw the power of the cross out. And uh, when we do that, we get into bad places. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. We need the power of God. It doesn't matter if the world thinks we're foolish. It doesn't matter if the world thinks we're foolish about what we do or why we do it. They should think it we're foolish. If the world thinks we're smart, then we're in the wrong spot. We're doing things wrong, most likely, if the world thinks we're smart. If the world thinks we're smart, that means we're like the world. And that's not a good situation. We need the power of God. We don't need to be smart. We're not smart. It's, it really is very true. We're not. We, uh, we as people, we all like to think we're smart. We, uh, we like to think we're right. We like to think we're correct. It's amazing. Um, we're, there are different intellectual levels in this room. There are those who are rather intellectually lofty and those who are, there are those who are feeble-minded in this room. And it's interesting that those who are feeble-minded think that I'm talking about someone else. I would say we're all feeble-minded in this room. We're all much more feeble-minded than we realize. And we desperately need Christ because we are feeble-minded. We need Christ to be wise for us and we need his wisdom because we're not smarter than the wisdom of this world and the devil and all his lies and all his tricks. Yep. We're not wise. We need Christ's wisdom. Um, let's see. I jumped out on my notes there somewhat. Where is the wise? This is uh, 
verse 20, where is the scribe, where is the disputer of this world? If not God made foolish the wisdom of this world, God doesn't use the wisdom of the world to reach people. God doesn't need disputers. He doesn't need the scribes, the wise, all these things. It says, after the wisdom of the world, after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So the world in its own wisdom knew not God. So in the world's wisdom, it rejected God. So God sends the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The world doesn't want God's wisdom. It's got its own wisdom. So God sends his foolishness, if you will, as it calls it, the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel of Christ. Um, God sets aside man's wisdom for in order for us to be saved. And in order for us to live right, we need to set aside man's wisdom too. We can't live right by man's wisdom. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So Christ, we see, is what is the power and wisdom of God. Him and Him alone. We don't need intellectual exercise for our Christianity. We need Christ. We need the power of the gospel of Christ. Um, for our life to be enjoyable, we don't need all the things of this world. We need Christ. For our life to be good, we need Christ. We don't need a happy, um, what this world considers to be happy situation. You know, a uh, wife or a husband and kids and uh, enough money to get by and enjoy yourself and <clears throat> know, cars and boats. All the things the world considers to be happiness, relationships and money and, and uh, leisure and ease and, all the, and maybe even a meaningful career and a meaningful purpose in life. All these things the world considers happiness and wisdom. They're not Christ and they won't make us happy and wise. They'll make us spoiled, destroyed, ravaged and uh, ruined. Christ is the power of God and Christ is the wisdom of God. It goes on to explain why God chose foolishness of preaching. He chose it to confound the world. He says, um, For you see, we are calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And this would define us, um, the unwise, the unmighty, and the unnoble. This would define us. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. If we're going to confound the lost, it can't be with us being mighty, noble, and wise. It has to do with us being based on our own sight and being filled with the power of God and nothing else to reach the world for Christ. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God hath chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring the not, the things which are that no flesh should glory in his presence. Why has God done things this way? Because if through our own strength we could be delivered, and if through our own strength we could deliver others, we would boast, and we would have whereof to boast. So there is nothing in this world we can do to reach the lost for Christ apart from the power of God, and there's nothing we can do to be saved apart from God. It's all from Christ, all this power and all this true wisdom. It's not of the wisdom of this world. Um, We'll look briefly at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. There are 16 verses which bear looking at. I don't think we're going to be able to really get through them all, but we'll look at the first few verses. Um, <clears throat> what does your faith stand in? What is true wisdom? Chapter 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. When Paul came to the Corinthians and he preached to them, the way they got saved wasn't because Paul had excellent speech. In fact, they said that uh, Paul's bodily presence was weak and his speech contemptible. After years of being beaten down and stoned and uh, assaulted as he was by the time he got to the Corinthians, Paul probably was physically quite a mess. Um, he was probably lean and gaunt from spending too many years in prison not getting much to eat. And from all the physical pains, he was probably racked by some different diseases from his traveling and stuff. Life was rough back then for the traveler, very much so. Paul's physical presence was weak. His speech was contemptible. Physically, he was nothing to look at, and the Corinthians valued physical beauty very much. Uh, you look at the Greek sculptures from around that era, you know, all the sculptures were um, kind of 
an exemplification of their concept of physical beauty. They were very much an intellectual beauty as well. Um, Paul brought neither. Um, his preaching of the gospel wasn't of wisdom. It wasn't excellency of speech to declare the testimony of Christ. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. This really needs to be our life as believers is for us to know not anything save Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's um, when we start to get the wisdom of the world instead of the wisdom of God, it starts to destroy us gradually and subtly. And this is what we need is Christ and him crucified, nothing else. For I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We as believers run the risk of getting to a place in our Christianity where we've started to grow in Christ, and then we start to become enamored with our own intellect and with the intellect of perhaps even believers who are writing about things from the Bible, and we allow our faith to stand in the wisdom of men. We are warned very strongly not to do that. A great example of this going on right now is the issue of Calvinism. Um, Calvinism, you know, basically the teachings of uh, John Calvin in particular, that uh, God specially selected some people to go to heaven and specially selected for no apparent reason the rest to go to hell. And Calvinism typically gets into complicated arguments about why Calvinism is true and discusses church history. And um, it, uh, it tends to be a major intellectual exercise. <clears throat> when a person's faith stands in the wisdom of men, a person's faith is not in the wisdom of Christ, and it becomes a disaster. The interesting flip side to this is uh, there are some believers who kind of make a knee-jerk reaction to Christian intellectualism, and they become um, anti-intellectuals of a sort, if you will. And uh, it becomes just as much the wisdom of men. What's that? It's Charlie. Well, not really Charlie. Maybe it is Charlie. Who knows? Um, basically, uh, they basically uh, say that, you know, uh, hard work and study in the Bible is unimportant and that uh, any kind of education of a believer is unimportant. Um, the idea of using uh, grammatical rules to understand what's going on and being said in the Bible is unimportant. And I don't mean trying to retranslate the Bible and that kind of stuff. But, you know, where it says, uh, well, just different things. I, I can't think of an example which comes to mind. Open my mouth and I will fill it. What's that? Open my mouth and I will Yeah, well, they'll like grab a Bible passage, take it way out of context, make it say all kinds of strange things. It's kind of an anti-intellectual movement. It's just as much out of Christ as intellectualism is, and it, um, it develops its own strange and weird doctrines in the pursuit of being unintellectual and being opposite of the uh, people who've fallen into intellectualism instead of Christ. Don't fall into either. Follow after Christ. Don't follow man's ways of doing things. It's important for us to do our best to study the Bible, but we need to study the Bible not with man's way of doing it. Um, we need to grow in Christ, but our growth shouldn't be in man's way. Um, there are some, there, I can think of this one Bible college uh, back kind of near where my parents live. The uh, students who would go there, they went to that Bible college to learn the Bible, and pretty much everybody got A's, and they came out with no idea whatsoever Really, I mean, their idea of preaching a sermon was you yell a lot and uh, kind of run through the Bible a little bit, maybe grab one verse, and you make all kinds of noise. But they never really learned how to just read a passage and just to calmly explain what that passage is saying. Um, God is the one who invented grammar in these sort of things. And uh, God wants us to study his word and understand what the words mean. Words are very important, as we learned in our previous Sunday school series. So the idea isn't to completely throw out um, any kind of study, if you will. The idea is to learn to study the Bible God's way, not man's way. And to let the Bible be your wisdom, and the Bible to be what guides how you think, not man's way. If you come to the Bible with a preset idea of uh, basically 
how to filter the Bible through, then you'll gradually end up in error instead of letting the Bible set how you think. Don't follow after man's wisdom in your Christianity. Don't let the world tell you how to be wise. Be wise through Christ. And uh, beware of the world. The Bible says, evil communication corrupteth good manners. That is, uh, evil fellowship, the, uh, the evil speakings, the evil ways and teachings of this world, <clears throat> they corrupt good manners. They will corrupt you if you expose yourself to them. Every time I wear a white shirt and touch my engine, the white shirt comes away black with oil. And every time you as a believer will let yourself be exposed to the world and absorb it, you will come away stained and soiled from it. It's not good for us. We need instead of the world, we need Christ, and we need to grow in Him. Let's pray. Dear God, please be with us in the morning service and uh, help us in a great way. Help us not to see the world through our own eyes and through worldly wisdom, but to see it through the uh, Bible and to see our need to live after the gospel and need to live after the power of God, not in wisdom of this world, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.